So by your girlfriend breaking up with you, your race car gained 200 horsepower? Pretty much, yes. I am a content creator at the Nürburgring, the world's most famous and exciting racetrack. Is this something that you've always wanted to do? Absolutely not. I had no interest when I was a kid in racing in general. I cannot think of a life without a Nürburgring at this point. What has been your toughest moment at the rank? When someone dies and kills someone else as well. The 430 driving behind hit the oil slick, crashed. There was a multi-million euro court case said we're done with this track. That's when it became like really crazy. Made some very interesting connections that we maybe <laughs> should keep off camera because those kinds of people want to stay uh, off the radar. So you were treated like an oligarch without the bank balance? Uh, yes. It was fear and loathing in Las Vegas meets Wolf of Wall Street. Another guy who I realized soon enough that he was like a real pathological liar. Everything that I built with my uh, soul and body into that uh, company and my heart, it was again taken away from me. Do you want to upset some people? Yes, because success is the best revenge. And who knows one day something might happen. We've actually come all the way to the Nürburgring today. You are our first ever European podcast. Every other one has been uh, done. Because of the Brexit. In so the you're UK. not European. Yeah, yet. basically. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what though? Uh, I wasn't I wasn't a vote of a Brexit. I wanted to stay with you guys. Um however, I must say, reflecting, looking back on it, we get flashed a lot when we come over here and we never get anything now anymore. <laughs> so it's like one autobahn from the channel tunnel all the way to Germany now, even if you're in a four and a half meter long crafter van. Uh, but this brings me on nicely. Misha, I have no doubt. Uh, that listeners know who you are, and but they may not know necessarily about your story, especially the fact that you've gained quite a large following recently. Um, so today I'd actually like to go into your story from where you started to how you've got to where you are today. And I like to open these podcasts with Misha in your own words, who are you and what do you do? So it's a very good question. It's a very good point. Um, so who am I today? Because who am I today? It was different who I was yesterday and probably who I will be tomorrow. Today, I am a content creator at the Nürburgring, the world's most famous and exciting racetrack. I do from driving different cars to documenting where you can get the best steak or the best tiramisu to showing how I race and walk my dog and all the shenanigans around it and also capturing the whole vibe and atmosphere regarding racing, tourist drives, track days, and everything. And I post it all on my YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. And those are like the four main channels, yes. So did you grow up wanting to be a racer and admiring the Nürburgring? Was this something that you always wanted to do? Absolutely not. I mean, as a kid, yes, I had influences of uh, me seeing the, the car for the first time start up or hearing it. And uh, that's the story that my mom would always tell my friends that uh, when I was a kid, like well, three years old and could barely talk, I would always, when a car would start up its engine, I would be like, ah, there's a car. Uh, and I would know all the brands of different cars, different car makes. And I would spend many hours with my dad in his garage holding a flashlight and getting yelled at because I was not shining at the correct part of the engine that he was trying to fix and of course later on playing need for speed you know watching fast and the furious all kinds of similar influences that uh, we as well i'm in my 30s and i, I believe people that uh, are into cars around this age they have we all have similar kind of influences and key figures uh whether it's ken block of course may you rest in peace and um, these things, of course, influenced my love for cars and desire and passion to one day have something that makes a lot of noise and can go fast. But you also have to stay realistic in a certain way. And you're like, hmm, it would be great to have that. And you have, of course, a poster of a car on your wall. Um, I don't remember what I had. I mean, I love the E34 M5, yes. But uh, having said that, actually, Nürburgring was... I had absolutely no interest when I was a kid in racing in general uh, or uh, like Formula One. Even nowadays, I don't really watch Formula One races. And the Nürburgring itself as well, that's a very funny story. Uh, many people 
Well, simply don't, don't know how I ended up here, especially with the recent uh, growth. You weren't, of, you weren't born. No, at- exactly. I was not born here. So I was born in Russia at the age of 11. Uh, when I was nine, my parents divorced and then my mom married uh, a guy in the Netherlands. And that's when I moved with her together to the Netherlands. So I grew up in the Netherlands with her. So I did my last two years of the primary school, the high school, the university. So the whole upbringing and the whole, let's say, conscious youth I spent in Netherlands. So uh, when people ask me, who do you think you like, who do you consider yourself to be? I actually relate more to be a Dutch guy because I got all these like cultural influences from there and I have also on the Dutch passport, of course, etc. cetera. Um, I am definitely not German because I only moved here seven years ago and I'm here just for work. Although I love the country, I appreciate everything. I'm about to marry a Croatian girl. So there's actually lots of cultural influences in my life happening. But having said that, uh, we still didn't get to the part how I was at the Nürburgring. <laughs> it's going to be a long podcast. Yeah, I think this I one think could be a little bit of a long This could be very it. long. Because, because you were, when you're in the Netherlands, you only lived an hour and a half away from the ring, Yes, right? roughly an hour and a half. Right now it's two hours because they closed the piece of the Autobahn, so you have to have a small detour. But yeah, hour and a half I was living away. And at my peak of automotive interest, let's say, or abilities, I was having at a certain point, I had a race car, which had 705 horsepower, 864 newton meters of torque. It was a Subaru Impreza GC8. I was racing Time Attack Championship with it. And I was already like starting to be active on social media, but not in the way I am today, because we're talking about 2011, 2012. been in your early 20s. Uh, Yes, early 20s. And it was the very early stages of social media when people were like, oh, what's Facebook? What's Twitter? Um, uh, Every company should be there because everybody is there nowadays. So we should start it. There was like no such thing. People just started doing YouTube and not for the sake of uh, making a living, but because it was like kind of cool being there. And um, so having said that, I had a race car, I was racing. And for many people nowadays or ever since the last almost hundred years of history of Nürburgring, visiting this track, driving it especially is their life goal. It's the mecca of many automotive drivers, lovers of cars. They say, I need to come here at least once. I would love to do a lap and many people save literally years uh, to put money together because when we started, for example, in 2017 with Apex here, we had people messaging us, oh, I'm just a student or I'm not doing well financially now, but I'm going to come to you in three years. We're like, okay, cool story. And actually three years later, people would show up and say like, hey, you see my comment? I said, I'm going to make it and I made it. I'm here right now. So people make it really their life goal to come here. And for me, it was like, well, I could really literally hop in my car and drive here. I could <clears throat> race here or take a second water. No, That's important. Because I just want to make a, a point before we get cr- into the, the current part. You go, you say, oh, I had a racing car. But, but it's not necessarily that achievable for everyone to just suddenly have a racing car. I mean, a racing car can be whatever you make it, I suppose. Anything can be a race car if you believe in it. If you believe in it. Any so, shit box can be a race so, car. So, so what was your racing car and how did you get that racing car to be able to get you here? Uh, yes, sure. Um, but first back to the Nürburgring part. Um, so I could come here, uh, with my car or anything, but for me, it was like, mm, yeah, some old track in the woods, the Nürburgring. I really could not care about it. Like nothing pulled me here. Not even the history. I was just like living my own world, doing my own thing. And that was for me the, the part that I was doing back at the time. And then fast forward to today, I got here just because of a job offer I randomly got. And I cannot think uh, of a life without a Nürburgring at this point um, in my life. But going back to the racing car. So when I was 21 years old, um, I, uh, I was at the point that I had uh, some money saved up from working the various jobs I was working since I was 15 years old from all kinds of different things being a dishwasher for three and a half years old in Italian restaurant, working in toy store, working different factories, then slowly moving up into like a career ladder and like be managing sort of a small department at Philips, like the electronic company in the, in the Netherlands, uh, and slowly moving into the automotive sector. And I also inherited a small amount of money. Um, so that allowed me to actually, uh, well, purchase my first car, which was a Subaru Impreza back at the time uh, GC eight. And, um, then from, from one point to another, I ended up having a 700 horsepower, uh, time attack race car, uh, with, 
yeah, for someone with relatively, well, in comparison to the absolutely zero driving skills, um, and yeah, very idea of what I wanted to do. I was just simply doing things because I love them to do, uh, love doing them. So that's a quite a nice, interesting story of its own, how the car was built and it's a quite a long story, but we can uh, yeah, let's touch on it. that. Yeah, sure. So I bought this GC8 from a colleague of uh, mine that was working uh, at the time at the same company I was working for. And that company still actually, funnily enough, the founders and the management of that company left Netherlands and moved to the Nürburgring themselves as well. And now are running one of the most successful or probably the most successful wrapping companies here at the Nürburgring called Blackfish Graphics. And even a decade later, they are still doing all of my race cars. So they do all the Apex cars. So the rela relationship is still there. It's uh, quite nice to see. But uh, back then, one of our, uh, one of my colleagues, he was selling his GC8 uh, Subaru. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay. That's a very iconic car. Uh, I, I would love to have it. I had the money for it. I bought it. And I bought it with a very low brake pads on it. So brake pads were already gone by the time I actually purchased it. So I'm like, hmm. So what do you do then? Well, you can replace brake pads, but why not replace the whole braking system with a big brake kit? And while you're already working on a big, uh, on the brakes, might as well do something for the suspension. So I ordered big brake kit and the suspension at a shop that uh, we were close with at the time. And it was a, uh, like a time attack team in the Netherlands. So as they were installing these uh, brakes and suspension, I was walking around their showroom and looking at their cars, had a sat in some of their uh, time attack cars. They had the RX-7, they had uh, Mazda, another Mazda, uh, I forgot, the, a, a 323, uh, an Evo as well. I'm like, oh, that's a nice seat. Oh, that's a nice dashboard. Can you order these one as well? And actually the same day when I bought the car in June, the first thing I did when I came home, I booked a race car driving course, basically the core three day course uh, on the racetrack of Assen in Netherlands that would at the end of completion of it would allow you to have your race car driver license. I did not have any aspirations to race at the time. It was still kind of like, okay, it would be cool to do it one day, but I would love to have sort of like base skill level set with the car that I'm driving and who knows one day something might happen, you know? Uh, it was not a goal. It was still sort of like, it would be cool to be able to do it one day at that particular uh, point in time. Uh, so I had that. And then the next thing started to evolve. So I asked the, the shop owner like, hey, can you make me an offer to be able to run 500 horsepower on my car? Because I think I need more power because when you start building cars, the first thing you need is to have more power. But luckily I was actually starting in the correct way. First the brakes and suspension and then power. And he said, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Now, long story short, uh, it took me a bit like a month or so. I still didn't get any reply from him about the engine. So I went to another shop and I asked him like, hey, I would like to have this. And they said, okay, come over, let's have a talk. So he instantly he made the offer. I put a down payment for the engine and uh, that was kind of it. Now, uh, I went to another shop to install a couple of bits on the suspension, like uh, polyuterine bushings. And unfortunately something went wrong probably with installation because when I was driving on the road, my wishbone fell out. And then I almost nearly like had a massive, well, accident with the car. Luckily I was driving very slow, like about like, I don't know, 20, 30 kilometers per hour at the time. So it was like, okay, the wheel all of a sudden like went into wheel arch. So I had no car and that happened, I think on a Thursday and on a Wednesday following I had uh, it was my girlfriend's birthday and I booked us a week, uh, a day stay in Antwerp in Belgium. It was also like an hour away or so. And like, okay, I need to get there. I could take the train, but I'm a car guy. And a friend of mine was selling uh, a Volvo S70 at the time. So I'm like, I'm going to buy this because I think race car is going to, well, my Impreza is going to end up being a race car. I probably need a daily. So I bought that car. We went to Antwerp. Everything was uh, nice and dandy. All is good. So fast forward to November when I'm doing the race car driving course, uh, I passed, uh, I destroyed my third gear because they made out of butter on the, on Impreza. So that's normal, but uh, luckily it happened on the very last free driving lap. So no big deal. And, um, then it was time to already start building the car and I, I then committed myself like, okay, now I have my race car driver license. I have this car. I want to start racing next year. So I need to have a car with a roll cage. So, okay, we need to strip this car down. Then at some point on the forum, I found an offer of a coupe body type because my car was a four door. And I found a coupe body type GC8 
with a 22B body kit, so it's like a World Rally Championship car, uh, and already caged, installed for 2,250 euros at the time. And I had to pay, I think, 17 or 1,800 euros to put a cage alone in my four uh, in my four door body. So I'm like, you know what? Makes sense to get already done uh, coupe body. So I bought that, and as the mechanic was there to pick up the car, uh, he called me and he said like, hey, they also have another full chassis that we can use for parts. They, they're offering it for an additional 300 or 500 euros. I'm like, well, if you can use that, yeah, sure, let's do that. So he bought that. Then I came home uh, to, talking to uh, the, well, not not home. I went to my girlfriend and like, we oh, had dinner and like, oh, what are you doing? And like, oh, I bought two more cars. She's like, okay, that's it. I'm leaving you. Like it's done. There were of course more things happening in a relationship that she was probably unhappy about uh, because I was too focused on my cars or whatever. Like, and uh, because I was like, what, 21, 22 at the time. That yeah. was the straw that broke the camel's back. Exactly. So I'm not like, I'm not saying that uh, she's a crazy yeah. person and like, you know, left me. I'm sure there was lots of uh, things going on in our lives at the time, but it was like, that was for her. Like, okay, I'm leaving you. Uh, you love cars more than you love me. Maybe it was the case at the time, you know, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so now explain what happened next. <laughs> yeah. So the next thing happens, I'm like, well, okay, I don't need to have like fancy weekends in Antwerp and other countries and I need to buy a second car. So budget available. So I called up the, the, the engine builder and like, so uh, 500 horsepower, can we make it 700 horsepower? Then I have extra money available. <laughs> so by your girlfriend breaking up with you, your race car gained 200 horsepower? Pretty much, yes. And it became at the time the fastest, I think the most powerful Impreza, at least in Europe. There were, I think, uh, faster guys maybe in UK, uh, Roger, uh, RCM, Roger Clark, Motorsport, they were like the fastest with their gob stopper. But that car was extremely fast that I had built. Um, just, just so that we can keep everybody on a timeline. Yes. How old would you have been then? Um, had YouTube started then? Just yes or no on that. Oh, that's a, so I was at the time when the car was finished, it, I, w I must have been 22 or 23 years old. It's about 10 years ago. It, it's yeah, it's 10 years ago. Yes. YouTube. So when you go on my YouTube channel, and if you're going to sort videos from like the oldest to newest, you're going to see videos from like 12, 13, 14 years ago, because I was posting things because way back in the days, I was doing things with scooters, like 50cc, 70cc, modifying them. And from having a scooter that I actually initially bought to just use to get from A to B, I ended up having the largest scooter club in the Netherlands and participating with the drag racing championship with scooters. So it was quite crazy. But so I was posting stuff that I was doing back then, just like my drag racing run, some stuff, some things on the street that may or may not have been me because the guy on that scooter doing stupid stuff on my YouTube channel is wearing like completely blacked out helmet. So it, it's probably not me, but it's a cool guy that I have posted on my YouTube channel. Um, so I've been posting stuff back in the days and also with the Impreza that I was building, the only thing I have of that car is maybe one onboard lap of me driving on Zandvoort at the time. So people should definitely watch so they can comment how bad of my driving was back in the days. I would slate myself down how bad it was, horrible it was. And I have a dyno run when we reached the, the 700 horsepower and 864. Oh, you did reach it then? Uh, yes. So uh, yeah, yeah, we did reach it because, because I remember like, the, the like run number three or four was like 699 or something. You know, like I need, we need to, like, <laughs> he's like, don't worry, small mapping, 705, 864. Um, so we did that and it was, uh, but so re uh, related to your question, I posted these, these two videos on YouTube or something. I did not see YouTube as something that I could make my living off. I was mostly focusing like, at the time, I was running probably 20 different forum project pages. So I had project page on Subaru Club Netherlands, Subaru Club uh, like uh, UK, uh, US, then Luxury for Play was a different website, uh, like co completely irrelevant websites that would have a subtopic of a car. Uh, I would run all these things there. So luckily all the forums were, they were running the same uh, source code. So you could just like copy everything with 
uh, image link to your uh, photo bucket, bucket or Facebook and everything the same formatting will be just copy and pasting. But I would run 20 different pages and on top I would post occasionally picture on my Facebook and that was kind of it. I remember at the time when I was still studying and going with, with a train to the university, I started reading in newspapers about upcoming YouTube stars who would like earn lots of money on there. But I'm like, well, okay, whatever. Like, like uh, Casey. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, Casey Nice. It was before his time. I think, uh, I think even PewDiePie was not there. I think Jenna Marbles, uh, you had like these kinds of names. Uh, um, like boyfriend versus girlfriend was also a big channel at the time, like the, the first million uh, people. But um, it was for me not something like, okay, this is something I would like to do or how am I going to do it? Kind of like it was for me out there and I was doing stuff because I just simply liked it. The first time that I actually made money even on YouTube, it was with one of my scooter clips that went kind of, I would, I would say for at the time, 12 years ago, viral, I think it got maybe like 100, over 100,000 views. I'm like, okay, that's something is happening there. And the trash, threshold of getting your AdSense payment was reached. So I'm like, oh, I got 100 euros out of it. Cool. Uh, and that kind of like went away. You know, I didn't put much thought to it. I didn't say like, I could make a career out of it. It happened almost 10 years later when I started focusing on it and thinking like, okay, how can I make, I can actually make money of it. Let's see what I can do with this. Uh, we are we now in the timeline? <laughs> no, you're. <laughs> I'm so involved in this. So where, where we are at the time is probably ten years ago when you posted those first YouTube videos. You built your race car, the Impreza. Yes. You've hit your 700 horsepower because the girlfriend dumped you, so it yes. wasn't 500. It was actually 700. Yes. Are you at the ring yet? No, no, not at all. So. Uh, a lot of things have happened in between for a lot of people that might be actually boring now because we want to hear the Nevergreen story, but there's a lots of things that le lead up to this. Uh, we can even take a step back to my scooter career because it's actually quite important how I got into the car world and what happened next and how I ended up here. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to tell you all the scooters that I owned and how much money I wasted on them, like from every, like literally 90% of my income uh, washing dishes and being in the factories went into modifying these things. So whereas the kids back in the days would spend everything on a Friday and Saturday night uh, on beer and booze and drinks, for me, it was like, I need to get a faster cylinder. I need to get a better clutch. I need to get this. I had everything calculated of how much my, uh, like how many weeks I need to work, how many times in the holiday I need to work and how much money I would earn at the end of the month and what I can afford then. And I would then just like, well, survive on my parents, uh, like them offering me dinner at night, you know, not having to go out and not spending money there. And 90%, like literally 90% of the income went into modifying scooter and then like 5% went to paying like my phone bill and maybe something else and that kind of stuff. Um, but long story short, towards the end, uh, when I was already participating with the drag racing championship, the organization, actually uh, the, the leading person who is now also running Blackfish Graphics, the wrapping shop here at the Nürburgring, um, they wanted to actually expand into the world of cars and to create a drag racing event uh, in the Netherlands that would focus on exclusive cars. So like Ferraris, Lamborghinis, supercars, hypercars. And the first event took place, I believe in 2008 or nine. Um, I, th I think it was 2008, yeah. Uh, it was quite a success, but for people who know Dutch culture, it's people are very humble. You should not show off if you have money, if you have a million, you should still ride your bicycle. You should not offend your neighbor. So uh, it's quite difficult to get participants there. So majority of our people were, were actually from Belgium to, uh, with, with their cars. And at the same time in Russia, uh, Moscow on Lim 500 plus started happening. So it was a drag race on a full mile stretch with not only very exclusive and expensive cars, Lamborghinis or Ferraris or you name it, but also modified already. So not just Lamborghinis, but twin turbo Gallardo with the pushing 2000 horsepower 10 years ago, that was already quite crazy numbers. Uh, and them doing drag racing. So, uh, we said, well, the organization of our event said like, well, Misha, you're Russian, they are Russian, go there and let's see if we can get maybe some uh, participants for our event. 
So at the time I started like, okay, I'm not going to just show up there and uh, be like, yo, we have this event. Would you like to drive 2000 kilometers with your fancy car and attend our party? I think I needed to gain, to gain people trust. So I started to see where do they hang out on social media feeds? Okay, there was a certain forum that was in the BMW club for some reason was the main platform for them to post about them, about their their cars, about their builds. So that's where I started post myself. Obviously I didn't have, well, I had my car, so I would run my project car there, um, the project car thread, but on top of it also posting some memes and then to show that I'm also like kind of funny guy or something to gain their appreciation and trust and like to, to uh, become more or less friends in a digital space to then later actually go to their event and say like, here I am, it's me, you know, like. Uh, These aren't just, as you say, a normal supercar owner. These aren't, these are oligarchs, right? Yes. If you would have to put it that way, they, they are that, yes. And they're hanging out on the, the forums and chilling and that's how they get the release with their cars. Yeah, that's how they were doing because at the end of the day, there are different kinds of people, of course, like some guys who own everything in life, they, they either want to stay away from it or they don't care. And even nowadays, when you look at social media, uh, big names in automotive world, like, okay, let's take, for example, the first name that comes to my mind is Manny Koshbin with his massive collection of hypercars, uh, Bugattis and uh, whatnot. He's also openly posting everything out there. And there are many other names like him who nowadays posting openly with what they have. They might not give their full insights into their business income and how they earn their money or they may do that, uh, but they are not afraid of the spotlight and some people are. So there was just a certain group of people who- I've met people that are. Yeah, yeah. Who, there's a group of people who don't care. And at the same time, although they are there publicly in a forum, it's still a regulated space and place. You know, if you're an asshole or a dickhead, you're going to get banned from there and nobody's going to talk to you. So that's why it's like quite a sensitive way. You, so. you basically befriended these oligarchs to come to your car event in the yes, Netherlands. Yes, that's what we agreed on. So I went to their event and uh, we all became friends or pseudo friends, or at least we like to hang out with each other. And they agreed to come to our event. Unfortunately, our event at the time got uh, canceled out because of many reasons of uh, government regulations. They wouldn't allow us to um, let Based this- Based on what you said about the Netherlands being- Based that, humble. so I remember the first event, the organization spent, I think, between five to 10,000 euros on fencing because we had to fence off a piece of grass where a protected plant was growing. Mind you, it was a military airfield, uh, so like, Thousands of liters of kerosene and fumes were pouring over these plants, but God forbid if one spectator is going to step on that plant. So we had to. So that's kind of like crazy. How it works. Exactly how it works. So unfortunately, no event, could, a future uh, event, could take place because of all these regulations and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But I still maintained a connection to these people in uh, in Russia and uh, for what, whatever benefit it might be in the future. So it's worth just mentioning quickly, we are actually in the car park at Apex at the Nürburgring and there's cars being washed, there's cars going down the track, there's exhaust systems starting up. So unlike the normal, really quiet episodes <laughs> of the podcast, I think you're going to get the full Nürburgring experience uh, with things starting up around us. And we do have to have little breaks every now and then uh, just to go out for a breather. But we were at the point where you were talking about you'd maintained your relationship with basically a group of oligarchs that you've met in Russia, trying to get them over to a car event in the Netherlands that didn't actually happen in the end. <laughs> what did you then do from there? What did I do from there? Well, I just lived my life. I was building uh, my car uh, at that point. Uh, at that point, it was becoming too near to a completion. And I believe 2012, we're talking about... Um, there was a event happening in Spa. It was called Gran Turismo events. The event is still going on. It's a, it's an organizer that does different events all around the world from just like road trips to track events focused around exclusive cars. And these guys from Russia, they were coming over to that event. Uh, so they said, Hey, we're coming over. Would you like to, uh, meet up with us? Come to Spa. We can have some fun. I'm like, sure. Yeah. Why not? So dropped everything, went there, 
met, uh, had good time in spa, I drove for the very first time in spa. Uh, that was my first experience in spa. Also again, a track that was only two hours away from my home. Never went there because I had no interest of going there. All of a sudden some friends invited me over like, okay, we might as well do that. Um, met with some people there as well. Uh, some made some very interesting connections that we maybe <laughs> should keep off camera because <laughs> those kinds of people want to stay uh, off the radar, especially maybe in today's environment. Um, and uh, went home, had a great time. Then one of these people uh, all of, uh, called me over three days later and he said like, yo, we're at your place. I'm like, what do you mean you're at my place? I'm like, yeah, we're in Amsterdam. I'm like, but I don't live in Amsterdam. Yeah, we're in Holland. I'm like, yeah, well, Holland is not just Amsterdam. It's like, doesn't matter. Can you come over here and uh, we, we can have some fun? Like, I'm like, okay, sure, no problem. So one day I showed them around town, uh, you, like where you can get the best. Well, what do you get in Amsterdam? Of course, mushrooms and cookies, right? Um, so they had good fun. They they went away. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from the same guy, and he's like, "Yo, my business partner is coming over also for a like for a honeymoon trip with his friends. Uh, could you show him around there?" Like, okay, sure. So went over, did the same thing all over again. The guy went back. I get a phone call from him, like, "Yeah, thank you very much. You're one of us now because like everyone is so speaking so highly of you." I'm like, "Well, I'm just." being a nice guy and just like being a tour guide, you can say, or something, you know? So you were treated like an oligarch without the bank balance? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, well, basically let's, let me give you practical examples of that uh, off because the next point, that's when it became like really crazy. So two man, uh, two weeks, roughly two weeks after this, like whole Amsterdam shenanigans and my first track day in Spa Franco Shams, um, I get another, again, a phone call from the same guy and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm studying for my exam about rhetorics uh, or law, uh, what it was at the time. Like, yeah, whatever, come over to Vienna. We can have some, like, uh, we, we can uh, have some fun here. I'm like, uh, well, no, I'm studying for my exam. Like, dude, come on, I've been studying. We all been studying. You, like, you can skip out on class. Like, so I'll see, see you tomorrow. I'm like, I'm not driving or, to Vienna. Nobody says anything about driving. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm like, uh, aha, okay, whatever. So hung up, uh, continued like with my study. Also, I checked my email, a uh, flight ticket to Vienna on my name because he had still my passport copy or like my name from the when I was in Amsterdam, but with him at the time. Like, shit. Well, well, let's see where this takes us. So, at night, I write email to all my professors in university and my work saying like, I have a family emergency in Russia. I need to leave tomorrow the first uh, time. Sorry, guys, it's, uh, I, I have, I have to go. And I get reply from everyone from like the professors, from my work, take as much time as you need. Fuck, that's not what I want to hear at this point. Okay, well, so I hop on a plane to Vienna. Uh, I arrive at the location uh, and it's like a very fancy hotel. They had like this uh, massive security because I just like, you know, student guy with my uh, with my trainers and, and a suitcase. And like, who the hell are you? I'm like, well, I'm here for Mr. Mm -hmm, let's not call his name. Like, what? So they call like security and they're like, here is some uh, Misha for you, Mr. Sharodin. Like, oh yeah, yeah, please send him upstairs. We've been waiting for him. Like. All right. So they guide me like through this whole like golden hallway and like to this uh, private super VIP room. And the guy opens up like, right, you're here. So finally we can go to Budapest now. I'm like, uh, but I just got here. Like, yes, but we've been waiting here for you since yesterday. So let's go. Uh, so we hopped in the M6 convertible, uh, me, him and his girlfriend at the time. We're flying to Budapest from Vienna with very illegal speeds. He may or may not have been completely sober at the time, not only talking about alcohol. Uh, not the most responsible thing to do, but uh, that's that. Uh, let's say, to summarize the whole situation, it was fear and loathing in Las Vegas meets Wolf of Wall Street. So that's how the whole thing, things were happening. We're right for Budapest. We uh, spend the night in the Hilton in the in the Buddha Castle, like the the old part of the town. The following day, uh, we go to walk 
uh, and enjoy a bit of town, a bit of coffee. And uh, he, he said, oh, some friends of mine are in town. Maybe you could, uh, maybe we can meet up with them. We'll see, no big pressure. So we stop at the cafeteria opposite of, of the Budapest opera. So like very fancy, very classy. And then uh, his friends said like, oh, there they are. Uh, so like it's a couple, like an older couple and uh, a young girl, basically their daughter. So the older couple was dressed in a very like typical 90s Russian people with zero taste and zero money, I would say, like simple washed out jeans and a, like a lumberjack t-shirt tucked in into a, their like absolutely zero taste. But the girl was having like this bright green, like emerald green dress with like the fashion dress that I never seen in real life, let alone on, maybe even on TV. I'm not into fashion, but I'm like something does not add up here, you know? So we're sitting there and then at one point we're like, uh, oh, we need to go buy cigarettes because the friend of mine was smoking. I was also smoking at the time. I quit by the way. And um, like, we need to get cigarettes. We, we have only cards. We have no cash. So we ask the friend like, oh yeah, uh, can we get, get, get some money? So it gives us a hundred euro bill. So we go around the corner, buy cigarettes for like three euro 50 or something, whatever it was costing at the time. I come back, I hand him the change. Like, excuse me, sir, here. And he looks at me over, over his shoulder. It's like, uh, are you, what am I supposed to do with this? Are you offending me? But then in Russia, I'm like, uh, okay. So I just sit down, like, okay, pretend like nothing happened, sorry. So then a guy from, from the opera comes over and they start playing live music on a violin. And they play music, play music, and then, before, uh, shortly before that, actually, we went to the bathroom with a friend of mine, uh, and uh, he said, by the way, this is a vice president of Russia's biggest construction company. So I'm like, aha, uh -huh. so like proper loaded people. That explains the older couple being, we don't give a fuck how we look because we have all the money in the world. And the spoiled kid being like, I need the most fanciest, I don't know, not even Versace dress, but like even something more higher, you know? So like, this is like the type of uh, flux people and fluctuations you have there. So the live music comes on and I'm typing, uh, like I'm typing to, to my uh, roommate at the time because he was Slovakia and also very highly educated in, into culture and all the classical stuff. Like, dude, you're never gonna believe what's happening. So I'm uh, like, so million, like a lot of weekend millionaires, like, you know, who wants to be a millionaire question? I need to have like, I need to order a song, like a live song, what should I do? It's like, uh, Baldrick Smetana, uh, Baldrick Smetana di Moldau, because it's a type of song or like, a, it's not a song, it's a melody or a classic, classic tune, you know, that, People know, but it's not like typical Mozart. They know that they heard it before. It's freaking beautiful. They're in love with it. And it's like something like very niche, you, you could even say. So I order that and the guy starts playing that. And these like oligarchs at the table, like, Michel. You, you thought I've done a move there. I've done a move. That's a power <laughs> move. <laughs> and they're like, great taste in music. That's a very classic. Uh, and then these 97 euros that I had still from the cigarettes, like I gifted there. But what was your, what was your plan with all this? Why were you, were you just living life? Because I, I get the sense with you. And yeah. Obviously we went out last night and talking and there's that reel, that Instagram clip that, that flies around, which is I'm just living life, man. Yeah. And if I had to summarize currently the conversations I've had with you, you just seem to just live and there's not much of a plan that gets onto the next thing. That's actually, uh, I think you're right. So at the time and even today with a lot of things that I'm doing today, I'm just living life. Like, uh, up until I would say one or two years ago, I was not calculating my next move. I was not worrying what is going to happen tomorrow because that's going to be tomorrow's Misha problem. You know, today's Misha, has a different problem. So back at the time, it was of course being a naive kid thinking like maybe one day I can be like them having the type of money they have. Maybe, uh, maybe I end up having, um, becoming also their business partner or something like these wild thoughts that, they, like, that. that definitely did not happen. There were plenty of examples that I know from my friends, like uh, a neighbor from the apartment building when I was growing up as a kid in the nineties, he was fueling up 
uh, cars at the gas station making like, I don't know, 200 euros a month. And then the Mercedes pulls up and he starts talking to the owner and the owner said, you're a cool guy. You know what? You can run a couple of businesses for me because you seem like a hardworking. And then he ended up being a millionaire himself. So these stories exist. And I'm like, oh, maybe in the back of my head, maybe something like that might happen to me as well. So me having all this fancy lifestyle, we had it like, okay, uh, we did Budapest, we went to Barcelona, we went to Monaco. There are lots of like, uh, the guys were spending like tens of thousands of euros a day on me alone, like, you know, on the, the hotel stays and all the parties we were in Jimmy's in, in Monaco. There were all kinds of crazy stuff that we experienced, Formula One in Barcelona. So that's when people can actually pinpoint what year it happened because that's, uh, uh, Michael Schumacher crashed in front of me in turn one in Barcelona. So it was either 2012 or 2013. I think it was 2012. Any case, uh, they, uh, I said, like, uh, they said, you know, uh, when they were saying things such as like, you're one of us now, and they were already spending much money. I said, I don't want things for granted. Maybe we can work something together on. And I got the opportunity to go and move to Moscow for half a year as exchange student from my university in Netherlands that I was studying at the time. So I said, I have this opportunity to come to Moscow actually. So I, ha I will continue with my studies, but maybe I can start like working with you guys, for you guys, whatever you guys have for me, because maybe we can do something together. Who knows where it's going to end up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Of course, come over. We can set you up. We can like uh, do cool stuff. We have plenty of things. I'm like, okay, cool. So. Long story short, I leave everything in Netherlands behind. I hop on a plane, I go to university, so I, I signed up for this and then I meet up with them uh, again. Like, yo, so guys, so uh, I'm here now. So um, like, so can we do something? Um, yeah, 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 sure. We, yeah, yeah. Like just being completely ignored basically. And like, you know, and I'm there in the awkward position, but I, at the same time, I don't want to be like, yeah, but you promised like, but, but, but also at the same time, yes, but also no, you know, it's like, you just this done a big thing moving over that big move this. with the, with the promises of like, Hey, we're going to do like more things together. And it's not that I'm asking like, Hey, can you give me 10 grand or like 5,000 euros for nothing? Because I'm a cool guy. No, I want to actually work with you. Can you put me on, on the, on the job spot that you actually basically promised? And it was just like, no. So, and that's a paradox thing because. They enjoy my company and just like hanging out and uh, me, I don't know, being a translator for them or like uh, just showing them the, the nice parts there uh, or being a cool guy. But actually when I was uh, promised a certain thing to actually help them make money maybe in a way, it was like, no, that's, we don't want to deal with that. So do you think that then maybe you developed from that happening a bit more of a, I'm not going to trust people as much and a bit more of a fuck you attitude? Yes. Um, yes, definitely. Because, uh, I remember like at a certain point I was living, uh, simply off my student, uh, what's it called? Uh, credit student no. credit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I would get like thousand euro a month from, uh, from the Dutch government because they would, they would give you like, I think hundred euro, 150 euros or 350 if you're living outside and you could borrow extra money. That so you, had, you, would... you had a little bit just to live and eat and all the rest Exactly. Of it. I was sitting in my grandma's apartment and then browsing Facebook feed and I saw them, they would be like spending their holidays in Maldives, you know, bragging about how great of a time they would be having these friends of mine who then all of a sudden drop me. I'm like, you know what? Fuck you guys. One day I'll be sitting there and actually... Uh, last holiday, I was in like in the in Dominican Republic and in Cuba and like in white sand beaches together with my fiance. I'm like, you know what? Here we are. It took me maybe like six and years yeah, 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 at the yeah. time. Yeah, no, like, yeah, about because eight or nine years. That moment you're talking about some face, but you're still not at the ring. We're so still Misha, not at let's the ring. Get, how did you get to <laughs> the Nürburgring? <laughs> We're at 43 minutes. How did you get to the Nürburgring? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> right <laughs> if he goes this is a cool story eh? <laughs> it's not it's actually not a cool story at all so um i had a couple of jobs here and there in between with like from uh, studying i actually dropped out of college uh i was in my last year of studying and that was marketing 
um, it was business and management, or to be more precise, the study was called liberal arts and sciences with a major in business and management. So in the first year we had everything, we had neuroscience, we had law, we have rhetorics, we had like political science. Uh, so lots of cool stuff. And then the second year you could, you would have your major in business and management and minor I picked in law. And then there was also marketing involved, et cetera, et cetera, in economics. You dropped that. I dropped that out in the last year because then I started realizing that I want to do stuff with automotive something and yeah, probably for cars. yes, automotive marketing. And back at the time when I was already like skipping class, uh, either in advance announcing it to my professor saying like, Hey, I'm not going to be there that day, uh, but I'm going to submit my assignment to you. And like, where are you going? Well, I'm going to a race or I'm going to, I don't know, to a car event or to a car show. Like Misha, you're not gonna be like in the future making money with being doing car stuff. Like, well, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely proved them wrong. So then how did you get to the nerve grade? <laughs> Good point. Uh no, uh yeah, basically indeed. I dropped out. I was doing some other jobs. I uh, left those jobs. And then uh, at a certain point in time, I got a job offer, like a friend of mine messaged because he was into cars, he was racing, he was coming here to the Nürburgring and he had some friends here who started the company at the Nürburgring. He said, hey, they started the company, brand new company, and they're looking for someone to run their marketing, mostly social media, because nowadays, and we're talking about end of 2014, that's when social media was already booming. It was important. We were talking is uh, that was the that was the upwards trend. Everybody yes. was hopping on it. Yeah, and yeah. People like the Gym Sharks out there and all the rest of it just gaining exactly. like millions of followers in a year. Now social media is not what it was like 2009 when I started doing my car stuff. We're like, uh, it's good to have a Facebook page. Now it's like really that car stuff. You're obviously doing social media for different yes. brands and people that we talk about. But there is a, a certain name which some viewers might recognize that I'm going to bring up here that was Boosted Boris. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, Boosted Boris was... We're still not at the ring. Now we're going back in time again. Oh, God, no, 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 no. <laughs> Let's get to the ring. How did you get to the ring? <laughs> Boosted Boris is a very important thing, of course, related to YouTube, but maybe we should start covering the story of how I got to the Nürburgring. Massive train of thoughts here. So, um, yeah, this friend of mine said there's a company at the Nürburgring, they started a new business, they're renting out cars, they, uh, they're they completely brand new, they have uh, the investment, they have the money, they have a great location, they have great cars, but they have nobody to run the place or to run their marketing. And I would like to recommend you to them because you have by now already proven with various projects, starting from your own car to this and Juke R that I was like at the time promoting uh, uh, and also another like racing name that I was managing. So I already gained uh, sort of a name uh, for myself of what I can do on social media. So I'm like, okay, sure. I had a talk with them and they said, yeah, okay, we would love to have you on board. You can run our social media pages. Um, so that's what happened in 2014 at the end. And then at the beginning of 2015, when the season started, uh, I went to them and said like, guys, I can do it remotely, but I think it makes more sense if I'm actually at location and can post everything what's happening live instead of being here every like i don't know two weeks and actually here every single day they agreed to that so i moved here to the nervo crane that is how you got to the nervo <laughs> yes because i simply got a job offer again even at that time and before that i've been here two or three times for some other projects briefly uh that i came here uh i Drove the track as well. It didn't do much to me. I had a fast passenger lap in the rain. Like, okay, it was interesting, but didn't do much to me at the time and had no interest of uh, making anything because everything looked for me like, I don't know, still like old and like really not appealing. And, and yeah, if you were to rebuild the Nürburgring today, it would cost 40 million quid. It's one of the most insane tracks in the world and it took yes. 25,000 people to construct yes. it yet you weren't phased by it no because it's it's a even nowadays it's still an old track in the middle of the woods and that's also the beauty of it but at the time the misha at the time who was like in these fancy nightclubs and metropolis and flashy uh, nightlife you know you come here and it's like oh, okay well that looks kind of boring you know that was the perception maybe that I had of the place at the time. 
uh, or also because I was racing in the Netherlands with my race car and I had everything there located. I don't need to go somewhere else to have fun because I have everything at home. That was my perception, mostly. But you did come here and that perception was then changed? Yes. Um, it started to evolve because not only was I building up the brand and the business that was uh, that I was invited to work Which, for. To clarify to people, wasn't Apex. It was not Apex. It was another company. Uh, it was called Ring Garage at the time. Many people would well, probably remember or know it. It was in 2015. Now, like you mentioned previously, due to me being a naive kid previously and having, uh, being like, I don't know, they, they taking wrong steps and being like, okay, I'm going to stop trusting people. Like, even though I'm venturing into this project and it's a brand new and I can attach my name to it, I need something that is really my own. I need to have something that if even this thing goes south, I need to have something that will be still my own and no one can take away from me. So I decided to actually do something with YouTube. Now, two years prior to that, when I was working on another project, uh, I was at a car show in Sweden, and that's how we get to the name of Boosted Boris. Now I actually rolled into YouTube. I think that, that that's, we, now we can say that. Um, it was a car show in Sweden, Bill Sport. It's one of the biggest, I think the biggest, well, it's the biggest show in Sweden, one of the biggest in the world. Um, we were invited with our Nissan Juke R to participate there and uh, the brand, Downforce Clothing, they had a YouTube channel and they had this very charismatic character called Captain Redbeard who was running the show. So a big guy with a big red beard who would go and uh, harass uh, car owners with some like really typical Swedish humor, etc. On that particular weekend when the show was taking place, it, would, it was his birthday. And he said, guys, I love you, but I'm not going to drive 800 kilometers to a car show to make a YouTube video that's going to get watched by 20 for lucky 30 people, not thousand, but that's the views that they were getting on their shows uh, and waste my birthday on. So have fun. So I arrived there, we're having like dinner and the guy's saying, Misha, you're going to be our host for a YouTube channel. I'm like, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, why not? But we need to be at least as awesome as Captain Redbeard. So I had this image in my head of me wearing this Russian Ushanka hat and sunglasses because that's something that I... Uh, worn once when I went to like a very cold trip with a lots of sun in the middle of the winter and that image stuck to me like okay that looks kind of cool and we can put a sticker on the hat of your logo but what's the name like uh, VTEC Vladimir um, <laughs> no and then like oh, we came up with Boosted Boris <laughs> you know <laughs> you might you could have had a YouTube character called VTEC Vladimir yes <laughs> <laughs> but boosted Boris was what you went with. Okay, that's that's how boosted Boris how came into yes, so and that's how you got into YouTube. Indeed. So, for so basically, yeah, we we made three episodes there in Sweden, and instead of uh, twenty or thirty views, it got two between two and three and four thousand views. So I'm like, okay, and the comments were all positive. They loved my stupid humor. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I was trying and uh, people were supportive of it. Like the majority uh, usually happens when you start something new, people are supportive of it until you start getting big because that's when all the haters come out. Um, so people loved it. I'm like, okay, maybe I can make it into a thing. Um, and when I came to the Nürburgring, I decided to actually, okay, let me start actually doing this Boosted Boris character. Uh, myself, on my myself, own channel. On my own channel, Boosted Boris channel. Um, and in 2015, I made probably between 10 and 20 videos or so. I remember the first video that went viral for me, quote, big quotation marks viral. It was, I did a lap in a transit van and that of course everyone, everyone associates it with Sabine Schmitz because yeah, the okay, top, top gear, gear. etc. cetera, uh, with, uh, with Nathan, he was the driver and we did some crazy stuff and that was shared by Car Trottle. So the biggest page back at the time and still nowadays one of the biggest internet resources or like uh, pages. And because of the share, it got, I think, was it, I think it was 50,000 views or no, no, I think it was 13,000 views. And 
I could get 50 euros from that on AdSense. I'm like, oh my God, my first big money, my first big hit. It's so amazing. Nowadays, the video gets 12,000 views. I'm going to quit YouTube probably, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if, if it doesn't get 12,000 views within the first two hours. <laughs> like, Just for reference, when I sat at the hotel last night having food and I said to me, I was like, it's mad, isn't it? When I put up a podcast, you think about a thousand people sitting there watching that episode at one time while we're sat here eating. You went a thousand people in the stone and a hundred thousand people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's obviously you had about sixty thousand subs. Did you say you reached I think at the boosted peak, Boris? At the peak of boosted Boris, it was sixty thousand uh, subs, probably or seventy something around that. I haven't visited the page in a long time. <laughs> so boosted Boris has happened. Sixty thousand subscribers, something like that. Something like that on boosted Boris, and then the next stage of basically your journey at the ring continues. And that was by Apex happened and Correct. your YouTube channel continued to grow. Correct. Correct. So, uh, as mentioned, I started working at the other company in 2015. I finished the first season. I went back to Russia because I was uh, back at the time dating a Russian girl. So staying there over winter, sitting on my laptop, watching YouTube. And I ran into Casey Neistat, started watching his videos. And I realized, well, that's actually quite cool how he makes of simple things something interesting. Then I thought, you know, that's maybe something I should do because there were so many things happening at the ring every single day that I would love to document. But the way Boosted Boris was, it was more of like a character sketch. A lot of things I really could not do. It needed some planning. It was a lot of editing. I could simply not make every single day a video with the resources I had back at the time. But I could simply vlog as myself. So that's what I decided to do for the oncoming year for 2016, to film everything, what was happening up close and to show the realness of it. Now, at the time, uh, there were a couple of questionable business decisions made with the company I was working for. Namely, it got into a partnership with another guy who I realized soon enough that he was like a real pathological liar because of all the things I already experienced in the past with my naivety. I, my bullshit meter was very well trained at the time. So long story short, he was a simple mechanic at another firm who claimed to have McLaren F1, <laughs> who claimed right, to have go. other cars. And I'm like, right, a 30 million plus euro car and you're a mechanic at the Nürburgring, you know, and things like that. And what he was doing is like, uh, gaining trust of other people, collecting money from other drivers to then rent a car, for example, at uh, our or other stores, uh, not paying them, then the car would get crashed, he would disappear. And then the companies would be without any money and no, uh, no name to grasp because the identity he was working on was like kind of falsified and he was functioning under business name of someone else. It was a massive, like, but the thing is, I was telling the business owner, like, do not go into business with him. And I was looked down upon, like, you're just a kid who just running our social media. And that's the guy who's going to bring us hundred thousands of euros because he's bringing his VIP customers over from a di different continent. And we're going to run the 24 hour race. And eventually what happened, both cars got crashed and uh, there was no money. And uh, it was a uh, big story. Yeah. So. I was shooting that, but as I knew like, okay, I cannot put this on YouTube. I cannot put this on YouTube. Things gonna go wrong. And uh, then, well, let's wait how it plays out. So I filmed everything throughout the whole year, but I didn't post anything on YouTube yet because I'm like, hmm, I need to see how it's gonna end. Well, it didn't end well. Fast forward to the end of the year by October, October, November, uh, I stopped getting paid from that company. And I'm like, well, why are you not paying my invoices? Well, uh, because I believe you haven't done enough for us. Like, uh, sorry, what? <laughs> um, I'm not going to go into detail whether I have or have not done enough, but people have been following me since the time. I believe people can say that I did put the company on, on the map. Anyway, everything that I built for the last two years put my... Uh, soul and body into that uh, company and my heart, you know, and um, it was again taken away from me, so to say. And there I was with nothing and had boosted Boris that people loved, 
my own YouTube channel, like me, myself, that I intended to film throughout the 2016, but haven't done yet. Well, I filmed, I haven't published anything. You didn't publish. Didn't publish anything. Like, okay, what am I going to do next? At that point, I was already kind of, I wouldn't say like really publicly connected to the Nürburgring, but I already fell in love with the place and I knew that I wanted to be there and just continue the life that I had. And it was not a fancy life. I was not driving fancy supercars. I was occasionally driving a race car from A to B, but not on the, on the track itself. I was getting passenger laps, uh, but I was still living from paycheck to paycheck at the time. And I really, I, I loved it. I was simply loved the atmosphere. That's why many people move here and they fall in love with the place because it's just like a sort of, Jamaica for like car people. It's everywhere. The yeah. hotels, the restaurant, everything is lives and breathes. Exactly. The noises around exactly. the place. Exactly. Exactly. It's a place you will fall in love with and uh, it just like pulls you in and you get sucked into. So I loved it. And I knew even though I lost that contact, I knew I wanted to be back here again. So I was making lots of things like uh, I was, I had some race teams on my mind that I wanted to approach to like, Hey, maybe I can run marketing for you. I really wanted to get back into here. And I also uh, got in touch with a fellow named Robert Mitchell, who is the owner of Apex nowadays and the co-founder together with me. And the reason why I got in touch with him is because he came to Ring Garage. He met, DM'd the Instagram profile and asked like, do you offer car storage? And he came over, he started speak German to me and my German at the time was horrible. I'm like, can we speak English? Like, yeah, I'm an American. I'm American. I can speak English definitely. Like, okay, that's going to be so much easier for me. We started talking. I also made like Boosted Borders videos with his cars. He was like totally cool about it. Um, and then I started also talking to him over winter, like, hey, what are you doing? What's your main business? What are you doing at the ring? How come you're there? Would you like to maybe invest there or do something there? It's like, you know, I'm actually like, I'm thinking of doing cer certain things. I actually bought a property, which is Apex nowadays. Where we are now. Where we are now. Um, but at this point, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with it because I have actually already some other business proposals from someone else. And without going too much into detail, uh, for the fairness towards him, that deal didn't work out. And then he said like, right, that didn't work out. And you're my number one person. Obviously. In a way that's like, let's fucking show him. <laughs> yes. In a way that happened. So I had me being like, he said, do you want to upset some people? That was one of the like, uh, conversation points. Like, do you want to upset some people? Like, uh, I'm like, yes, because success is the best revenge. So fast forward to where we are right now. I think we are one of, I'd like to say, one of the iconic places, like one of the bigger names at the Nürburgring. And the other place that got rid of me is bankrupt. And um, yeah, so. And just to explain to people, um, summarized Apex, where we are now. Yes. What is Apex? What does Apex do? Right. Yes. So, uh, so the funny thing, um, there we go. Another story. <laughs> no, don't worry. I'll keep it simple. No, I think it's a very important uh, key point. So when I was talking in talks with Robert back in, uh, in the, in the winter of 2016, beginning of 2017, and then he had these like entrepreneurial questions to me, like, what do you see Apex in five or 10 years? And I said, listen, I cannot pinpoint what we're going to be, how many cars we're going to have, but I wanted to be an iconic name within the Nürburgring community. So people know us and we will see like, okay, well, that's nice to have actually like a great general goal. And what we started doing is car rentals for the Nürburgring for the track. Our main building is hotel buildings where we have five rooms where people can stay. We're offering also instructions for people who come uh, to drive our cars or even their own personal cars. Uh, we also have been running for the last six years, we've been running Ring Taxi. So, because it's not just something according to the Nürburgring policy that you can just come and offer. You cannot just say like, oh, hop in for my, with my car, I can give you a lap. Well, you and I are going for a lap later together, but this is just like- If you want to see that, I'm sure there'll be a link <laughs> posted to wherever that video is. Are you scaring the life out of your podcast host? <laughs> and I've never been on the ring before either. But be this, this is perfect. This leads me on to like a section about- I think people want to know how it baffles me when I hear things. How does the Nurburgring work? So you just mentioned there as a company on the Nurburgring, you actually had to bid for a one of four places to be able to take people around the ring. Yes, on ring exactly. Tax. So the rental business is not regulated. 
you can do whatever and nobody cares about it. As long as you obviously run street legal cars within the rules of being uh, damn street legal to, to run them during the tourist days. If you're running on a track day, nobody cares if it's a race car or whatsoever. As for the paid taxi laps, for whatever reason, Nürburgring 10, 15, 20 years ago decided, you know what, we need to regulate that business so people do not make money of it for some reason. Anyway, so the way it works nowadays and for the last like 10 plus years is you have a blind auction. So basically uh, you go to the network and you say like, I would like to participate with the bidding. And then you need to say, I'm willing to pay this amount and uh, per year for the next three years because the license is given to a company for three years. It's not just for one year. And then the top four highest bidders, it's a blind auction. So you cannot outbid someone. You just say like, I'm going to give this. And for example, the first year, the first three years that we did, one company, it's a very big car manufacturer, got outbid by one euro. So for example, they said, we're going to say, I don't know, 50,000 euro per year or something. And someone said, I'm going to do 50,001 just for shits and giggles. That is how I've won all of my automotive memorabilia, <laughs> silent auctions, by the way. It's, I, I do a little number over the top. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah. So the top four companies with the, the, the highest bidders, they uh, get to run uh, the ring taxi or the, the, the co-pilot rides. They're allowed to use two cars, two permanent cars with one backup car. And these three cars, they're allowed to change once per year if they have the necess necessity to. And that becomes a very tricky strategic business because not only you're limited to two cars only, you cannot just say like, I'm going to have 20 different cars and people can pick every single day. If you do it during a track day, that's not during the public sessions. There is no regulation for track days except for what track day organizer tells you to do or not to do. So you can then have 20 different cars if you want to. But for tourist drives, these are the regulations. So most of the companies then decide to have one very fast car and one four-seater car when where three people- C63 or- uh, Yeah, M5, M3, et cetera, et cetera. And then comes, then come there, we can make a complete full podcast about running the taxi program alone because it's such a difficult business. From the outside, it looks so lush and dandy. But first of all, you have all the running costs of the cars. You have the license costs that are like quite high per year alone. You have the purchase price of the cars. You have the insurance of those cars because it's not the regular insurance. You need to go to the insurer and say like, I'm going to run it as a Nürburgring taxi and, no, and the insurance needs to confirm that they insure you as a Nürburgring taxi. And that letter you need to present to the Nürburgring so Nürburgring can see that your car is actually registered and insured as a Nürburgring taxi with a big coverage for the passengers. So you cannot just be like, oh yeah, this is just a random car. You're paying big sum of money for the insurance there alone. Then you need to have personnel, like people strapping passengers in the race car. Like you need like three people alone if you're running a four-seater with buckle seats, et cetera. That's what we're having. You need to have salespeople on site. You need the people processing the bookings. So you have, for example, on the evening session, you might have three bookings. On the weekend session, you might have uh, 20 laps per car or something. Then the track closes for an accident. Then those bookings get moved forward. And at the end, people don't get to do their laps. You need to refund them or reschedule for next day. It's such a massive operation. And we did calculation for if everything goes well, no crashes, no major technical failures, engines blowing up or uh, COVID or floods that we had here. If everything goes well, in our case, the way we were running taxi operation for a million euro investment, we would be lucky with a 50,000 euro revenue uh, or like profit, profit. And at that point with such a small margin ROI, People will be like, why the hell are you doing this? For us, it was basically just a marketing operation. They put you on the map. Everyone's had a ring taxi. It's, well, yeah, ring taxi or Apex taxi because ring taxi is a company of its own that operates under that name. It definitely paid off. We put our name on the map. It was amazing. We had a great, uh, great time because the way we were running it, we wanted to have the most exciting cars. So we had, for example, at uh, our la latest stage, we had a GT2 RSMR, which was the record holder and still record holder of the fastest production spec car on the Nürburgring, together with a built BMW M3. Uh, four bucket seats inside the car, full roll cage, everything uh, 
like full blown race car. And then we come again to another very difficult point of the business uh, decisions when you want to do something cool or you should be doing something smart. Because here we are investing lots of money into these cool cars. And then people come to us and like, oh, we'd like to have a ride. No, I don't want GT2. I want to go on a GT3. Why? Well, because GT3 is a higher number than a GT2. So it must be faster. Or GT3 is more expensive car in my country because it's naturally aspirated. So it has more emissions. And in my country, em prices are regulated on emission base. So GT3 RS is more expensive than GT2 RS. Wow. So more expensive is more better. Or M5 is faster than M3. So that's the majority of people that actually come here and have no idea about cars. Of course, the people that we hang out with are car maniacs. They know every single engine code of a certain model type, and they would come from another part of the world to sit in this particular car because it's the fastest, it's the best, and they know the story behind it. But the average, actually, the mass volume clientele, they have no clue. And uh, yeah, they, and then, we need to ask ourselves the questions, do we need to invest these millions for these most expensive cars and the running costs and the personnel costs and everything to cater, to make sure that we would at the end of the day get 50,000 euros after a million euro investment to cater to the point. So we had a marketing run, it did very well for us, but to then deal with all these headaches and dramas, we said, okay, now it's we had a good six years. We're kind of done with it. To know more of that. Yeah, exactly. But you mentioned about the licenses and you, you actually have to have a license as well because alongside this, you're doing your YouTube channel. Yes. You have to have a media license as Correct. well. Correct. Correct. So that's the point of where we should probably elaborate, of course, a bit about, about my YouTube and how it came to where it is now because, yes, I did start posting the daily vlogs and documenting the whole process of Apex and the, the buying cars and driving cars, et cetera, et cetera. But the Nürburgring has a very strict media license when it comes to what you're allowed to show and what you're not allowed to show. First of all, if you want to show anything on the Nürburgring property, you need to have a media license. So what you go then, you then contact Nürburgring media department, say, I would like to film this and that on this particular day. And then, and then, and then you would submit the video for approval and then it gets approval or not. 10 years ago, cameras or anything filming onboard track related was strictly prohibited. Even nowadays, when you go onto the track, you will see like a big sign saying no pictures, no cameras allowed. They became throughout the years where we are now today, the official unofficial statement is if you're doing commercial activity, such as big YouTube channel, or you're earning money with it, etc., you need to have a media license. If you're doing private use, you just gonna memory video for memories. You can do, do it, whatever. That's fine. And back at the times when I was trying to do certain things, I was uh, trying to approach the Nürburgring, talk with them, talk to these people, say like, hey, I would like to do this and that. And they would simply say, no, you cannot do this. And then why? Well, because these are the rules. And that's how we are here in Germany. Rules are the rules. That's how we are. Like, but what about these other channels that posting crashes every single day? Well, we don't know who they are. We can, and we don't have time to police around and uh, like contact them and see what they're doing like yeah but you can do with me because you know where i am right that was the bottom line yes so step by step baby step by baby step i was still trying and pushing and then i was allowed to do one video i needed to get approved then I was allowed to do two videos like onboard videos or something that was approved then I could do the whole year of tourist drives and still videos needed to be approved. And then they would see like, okay, I'm not putting any crashes in. I'm slowing down for speed limit in bright shite. I'm not uh, doing any lap timing. Uh, and sometimes I would do certain things that I would not see the harm of it, but they would say like, Misha, this is not okay. Okay, please remove that. And then the video would get approved. So it was a very long and of course, obviously painful process to get where I am right now. And where I am right now, in the last two, last three years, I have a yearly media license to film on the, during the public sessions, also during track days, um, where I can do what I want uh, or what I want without asking prior approval. Uh, and as long as it's within the networking guidelines. 
And still even nowadays, uh, because it's it has become such a mass media production machine, if you would call so, because I'm putting a video every single day. Right now I have 106 videos in backlog. And today I might put up a video that I filmed four months ago because I, I might think, okay, this is a good time to put out that particular video. But I obviously have forgotten what happened on that particular day. And then there might be a, a car that parked alongside that actually crashed. I'm not allowed to put crashes in. And then Nibble Cream was still like, Misha, what the hell? Why are you putting crash videos? Like, I'm not emphasizing on that crash. It was literally just like, Driving past it. I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm going to take it down or so. That's cut it out in the edit. Cut it out in the edit post or something or take something down. And so things are still being monitored. It's not that I'm like, you know, I can do whatever I want. So you could lose that any moment. Of course, of course. Uh, and uh, of course it can happen that, I don't know, next year we're going to have a different CEO who for whatever reason dislikes me or someone else and they might revoke that media license, you know? And the risk is because you pass a lot of crashes and this brings me on to a, a massive question for me. I've got my own cars. I'm, I'm sure I will be bringing one of them to the Nürburgring. I don't have too many aspirations to drive the mm -hmm. van round, I must say. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's always the fear. It's like, I have this asset. Yeah. I go onto this track. I am totally uninsured. Mm. I can't have any responsibility really for the people around me. That is mm -hmm. their own prerogative. What happens in the simplest terms possible when someone bins it bad on the Nürburgring? Are we talking about someone or are we talking about me? Let's start with someone. I, came, I come here. Mm -hmm. I bring my Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. I go into a, a corner way too quickly, cross the track, hit the railings. Then all the railings, car spins across the road, someone else hits me, never ring close for a few hours. Okay, good. In that particular case, first of all, this is a public road. So you said you hit the railing. This means you will have to pay for the railing. Now, a lot of people, the, their first reaction is like, oh my God, Nürburgring is making so much money of people crashing into barriers. Uh, these barriers are there just to make money. No, these barriers are there to protect you so you will not fall 20 meters down the road and hit a tree and catch fire and die. So this is why they are there. Now, if you're going to hit, go with your Lamborghini and lose control and hit a bus stop on a public road, the government will charge you for that bus stop. They will probably charge your insurance and your insurance will pay, but the damage you cause on public roads also needs to be paid. So it's exactly the same thing that happens here. Also, any other racetrack in the world, the, the damages you do to the racetrack, you need to pay. Now, since it is a public road during the public session, classified as a public road, you either, most of the times, you the bill will be forwarded to your car insurance. Now you, as a British citizen of Great Britain, insured by the British uh, motor law, la la la, uh, every single insurer of, the, uh, of, uh, of Britain excluded the Nürburgring. Now they either say you are not covered on Nürburgring Nordschleife, or they might have some fancy wording such as you're not covered on one way motor tollways in Germany. Well, there's only one one way motor tollway in Germany, such as the Nürburgring. So they will not pay. However, by the European law, well, nowadays Brexit, I don't know how that's going to work. By the European law, insurer needs to pay for the damages because they are allowed, they have to. So they will pay for the barrier damage. And they will pay for the, if your car spilled coolant or oil and made another car crash, they will pay for that. But they will come after you because you breached their terms and conditions. So they, they will sue you and you will have to pay all of that money yourself. What do you that. think that could cost? It depends on the, the reason why- In my example. So the reason why all the British uh, insurers excluded because there was one particular case where a BMW M5 was driving and lost its oil pan, leaked oil all over the track. And there was like, I think, uh, some 911s, even the Carrera GT, maybe 430 driving behind, hit the oil slick, crashed. There was a multi million euro court case and all over the front pages in UK. And that's when the older insurance said, We're done with this track and we're done with this. So it's gonna cost you as much as the damages are to the track. The barrier damages are varying between nothing up to, I think the biggest bill I must uh, have seen was probably around 6,000 euros when the car went pinball between the multiple barriers. The average barrier bill is between 15 and two and a half thousand euros, I would say 1,500 and two and a half thousand euros. And then, like I said, if another car is involved, that needs to be covered if it is your fault. So again, since it's a public road, the police will be involved. So police will come, make investigation, who is at fault, 
uh, and uh, then make the report and then submit it to your insurer who then will analyze the data or the report provided and then can make the, the case. Now, British people and most of the countries, pretty much every country is excluded from the Nürburgring. German cars are still covered, most of them. M many of insurers start to exclude the Nürburgring because it's getting a bit crazy for them, for their feeling. But the majority of them, they still cover the Nürburgring during the public sessions, they cover those cars. So for Germans, it's less of a drama. So they, that's why they're like, okay, if something happens, I don't care. So that's the as elaborated answer as I can get when it comes to. But have you yeah. seen people that are paying back bills for say for a very, very, very long time? Yes. So even, even the, so let, let, let's take a step back. Like let's look at the rental cars that people come here and rent. All the rental car companies, not Apex alone, also other, everyone, all the cars are insured, but because of such a high risk, the insurance is there for the black day when someone dies and kills someone else as well. You know, that's when you say to insurance, well, this happened, help us out. When you've been a barrier, when you've been a bumper or something, that's when all the uh, rental car companies actually take their own risk. So the access on the rental cars is always around 50% of the value of the car. That's what the customer is responsible for. So in the case of a Volkswagen Golf GTI, okay, this could be only 8,000 euros or with a lower car, with some, some Twingo or some older car, it could be a couple of thousand if euros. like a GT3. When we take a GT3, we talk about, when I look at, for example, RSR Nürburgring, which is like the only car that offers these experiences with these kinds of cars. I think GT3 RS, I think the excess is 120 grand with I think 30 or 40,000 euro deposit that you need to bring. But what I'm getting at, um, there, those are quite high numbers and people come here and they just sign that away and they, we, at least in our case, I cannot speak for other companies. Well, I can't speak for other companies because we talk among each other and we know that we emphasize like, this is what you sign for. In case something happens, this is what you're responsible for. Oh yeah, 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 cool, sign away. Like, okay, you sign, like we really, we have, we have one major contract and on top we have an extra clausule with 10 extra points that they need to read and sign for every point that emphasizes like, hey, you are responsible for this and this and that you should not be doing. So we really made sure in the watertight scenario, and still, when people crash the car, they come in the office like, uh, so yeah, I'm insured for this, right? What? And then they start coming up with all kinds of different excuses that it was not them, something else happened in the car, something was with that, and like, unfortunately, you are responsible for this. And then comes the point, sometimes, I actually, think so. we, we've, been, we've been lucky and, other companies as well with like 99% or 95% of the cases where people can pay the money or they can pay money the next day. But there are sometimes cases like I don't have the money. Well, well then they need to call the bank. Then it's like uh, they ended up uh, getting a loan for these kinds of big amounts, tens of thousands of euros. And what happens afterwards? Well, I don't know. We get that money and we kind of like stay there. But these are unfortunately hard reality of terms and conditions. Misha, we've spoke about what happens when other people say in it at the ring, mm -hmm. you can't do as many laps as you've done without less than 1% of them going wrong. And in the past, some of them have. So yes. what has been your toughest moment at the ring? Well, the toughest moment at the ring, if we have to take this question literally is going to be actually, well, me losing everything back then with my previous employer, let's say, because that's something that hit me emotionally, probably the hardest, you know, you're building everything up and then all of a sudden you lose something. Of course I had crashes, uh, multiple of them by now, probably close to 10 or so, depends on how, like in on which severity you count them because from small scratch up to like completely total loss of, of the car. Uh, I think the most famous recent one is the crash of last year that I had with the BMW M4. Um, and it wasn't even that big of a dent, I would say, it, uh, but there was some chassis damage and everything combined, the bill was um, slightly over 30,000 euros on that. Um, so financially, this was the probably the 
biggest crash that I had. So with that car, because I've written off cars completely, race cars, just one actually. But according to the racing contract agreement, I was only responsible for the 8,000 euros of the insurance access of that. So it was kind of that, I guess. And you st- when you step into the- these cars now, you're so committed to this place. Are you committed that that lap could be your last? Ooh, that's a very tough <laughs> saying this way, but uh, you do realize you take the risks, you understand them, but you could not be thinking about them constantly. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing that. I think every single race car driver, every single extreme sports athlete, rock climber, boxer, MMA fighter, they realize that things can go extremely wrong, yet we're still out there doing them. Why? Hmm. And when, when those things do go wrong, most people rely on a support network of people. Yeah. Now you've mentioned um, that you've got a fiance that's mm-hmm. here at the ring. But we obviously spoke about your childhood and growing up. When you have a moment like that, who do you actually have to go to? For emotional support? Well, I have emotional support dog for that. (laughs) Uh, And of course, my fiance as well. Yes. Um, And those are the, the most important people aside from certain people at Apex as well. And Robert as well. He, I would say, is my closest friend where I can go, whatever, whatever shit happens in my life, uh, I can go for him, like to him for advice or uh, kind of help. I haven't gone to for financial help to him. <laughs> so, so that's at least that. Uh, have, has your parents ever vis- visited the ring? Yes. So uh, my mom visited in 2019 together with my grandma, actually. So I took them both out for a lap in the Audi R8 uh, that Audi provided me with because back at the time I was working for Audi as well. And that's also for people asking me, what's your favorite lap, the best lap ever? Like that's for me the lap. When I took my grandma out, who was at the time 80 years old and we did a lap of a Nürburgring. And before that I drove with my mom and my mom was saying like, that's so fast. No, and I was already like kind of holding back and like, but with grandma, please slow down even more because I'm really afraid for the, this is going to be too much for her. So like, yeah, sure, mom, no problem. So I go with my grandma, like we start driving and like, are, are you okay? Go faster. I'm like, okay, are we okay? Go faster. I'm like, um, all right. <laughs> and then she was having the time of her life and we did 300 kilometers per hour on the main straight here. And I was like, I did 300 kilometers per hour in Audi R8 with my grandma. And that was for me like the most memorable experience. My mom, she kind of went with it. She didn't find it like exciting or anything. And also with everything I've been doing in the past, whether it was like my scooters or YouTube stuff, every, she was always like, nah, what's that going to bring you to your life? Like you should just go study and go get a nine to five job. And uh, like what you're doing, I don't see the benefit of it. Like, like with majority or like of, I would say entrepreneurs or people who want to drive, do uh, crazy thing. They often don't get the support from their parents. Uh, my dad, like I said, in the beginning, my parents were divorced when I was nine years old. He remarried uh, with someone. And ever since I actually never had contact up until 2018, that's when I found out that he had cancer. And then a year later, he actually passed away. So unfortunately, I never got the chance to share these moments in real life with him to take him out on track, something that I really would want to. And this is something that I always like, kind of like tear up when like father, son come to the Nürburgring and have this experience. And, uh, he wasn't interested. Uh, he, um, I don't know. He was never like, he was never interested in maintaining the normal contact even like, you know, if I, if I would be there and still in Russia, whether studying or something, and I would call him up like, Hey dad, I'm here now next to, to your apartment. Should I stop by? No, no time. No, don't want to, no interest or something, you know, and then it would be like nothing. And the, the only, like the most time we spent together was when he was like, well, he got his cancer and then I would be flying over there trying to say goodbye or me going to the medical, to the doctors or et cetera, et cetera. So it was like, why, why, what, why for someone that didn't support you in that way and didn't want to see you, why did you want to give the time to see them? The last memories I had of my dad was. 
uh, up until he left us for whatever reason. He found a new love of his life or I don't know why. He had his reasons. He, he married someone who was like, I think like 15 years younger than him or whatnot. So midlife crisis. I don't know. I don't care what happened in his head there. But up until that point, when we were together as a family, he was always there for me and he would always invest his time. He would sit with me on the floor, play with my toy models, with the cars, we would play Need for Speed together. He would let me win. We would have bets. He would uh, uh, watch movies with me together. Like you go to the, uh, like I said, in the garage, I would work out with him. He would, up until that moment, he was the best dad ever. Then something switched. And I would like to believe that it was not because of him that he stopped uh, looking for contact, but maybe because of his new wife. There is a lot, but I'm not like, maybe, you know, uh, but until that point, he was the best dad for me ever. And what happened afterwards that, that he became so cold? Well, the last moments that I spent with him, he was actually like, uh, very proudly speaking of how I was doing things on YouTube of uh, like, and actually specifically pointing things out of like how I was driving certain cars or how Jeremy Clarkson was mentioning me in one of his videos uh, shortly. And uh, he was extremely proud. And what I've been hearing from his family members, our family members, our friends is when he was like suffering and dying and like uh, literally screaming at night from pain. But the moment I was there, he would be, quiet and actually trying to be normal with me in the last moments of his life. And yeah, whatever happened in between, I don't know, people have their own reasons. Why didn't he reach out to me or didn't want to spend time with me? Maybe his wife wouldn't let him. Maybe he was ashamed of the fact that he left a perfect life behind and now is left behind while we are having a better life and I'm maybe a better person or something. I don't know. There could be so many reasons why people don't have contact or don't want to. And you mentioned that your mother didn't, I say approve, didn't understand the journey that you were going to go on with all this and just yeah. thought it was ridiculous. Yeah, she was not against it. She was just like not supportive either. She like, I do have to say that when I bought a motorcycle at the age of 21, she kicked me out of the house. She said, I don't want this because if you're going to die on that thing, it's because of me not doing anything against it. And I cannot have that on my conscience or something like what? <laughs> Aside from that, and this is the first time ever I'm going to say publicly, the man she married to was an alcoholic and an abusive husband. And I've been going through that as a kid up until I became big enough to stand up for her and for myself. And when one night he decided to raise her, his hand against, I almost beaten him to death. And she dragged me off him with my hands covered in his blood. And then she said, actually, well, it's not the motorcycle. You are go you're too violent. You're going away. While I was there to protect her. So that's another point in life where I lost everything and was there out on my own and trying to figure things out, what to do. And who did you turn to then? Uh, that was uh, Inne from Blackfish Graphics, the same lady who is running this wrapping shop. And uh, she, we were good friends at the time. And she said, you come live with me because this cannot go on like this. So I stayed with her for almost a year until I found my own place uh, when I was like studying in the university. Which is why the community at the Nürburgring means so much to you. Yeah, because after the age of nine, when my parents broke up, I never had the sense of family, I would say. I never had anyone I could turn to because my mom had her own problems with dealing with her husband or raising my half brother or, or, or. And I was trying to avoid this place of misunderstanding of violence, of alcoholism, of whatever not. So that's why I was outside trying to build my scooters, build up the community, build up my friends, being with friends and be, uh, trying to get at the end, maybe approval of other people because I would never get approval from my parents at home. So that's why we ended up here, I guess. 
with YouTube. Maybe. Possibly. That could be a very one of the reasons why I was trying to... I find it absolutely fascinating how... where you got the ability to just keep stepping forwards from. There is no, no other way, you know? There's like a... You know, the, the, the story of two... Uh, of, of two frogs that end up in a glass of milk. Two frogs end up in a glass of milk. One drowns and the other one starts going this crazy, crazy, crazy until milk t turns into whipped cream and then the frog gets out. So you can either die or you can actually just keep on going until you get out. Well, <sighs> cool, that's hit me hard, that. <laughs> you don't realize there's so many people and people that I speak to on this podcast and from the outside to 700,000 YouTube mm -hmm. subscribers, people may just not realize what's actually made that person present themselves in a way that they enjoy to watch or what's gone to building mm -hmm. that, that character. But that is, that is a hell of a lot there. No, for sure. I mean, uh, it's always you all, most of the people live in their moment. And when they look at like, okay, he has 700,000 subscribers. So he's driving all these cars. These cars might, must belong to him or he must have a rich parent or it's been given to him or, and there's nothing wrong with that when that happens, you know, but quite often, like in my case, I can definitely say I fought for it and I lost everything I had two or three times in my life. And yet here I am again. And I, and I might lose it again tomorrow, you know, but I will keep on going. I will come up stronger with something else. You know, I like to say my life is like a ref counter. It goes up, reaches the real limiter, then you go up a gear and then it drops again. So if you, even though you lose momentum or something, you're actually in the higher gear. And would you say that you're currently in that higher gear? Ooh, hard to say. I mean, it's, uh, let's say I have. Problem with you is you just add an os. <laughs> true true no in my case let's say where i am right now i am very fortunate i am very happy where i am right now i would like to say i have somewhat of a stable life um because my priorities for the last two years the last three years since like 2020 when i uh, went to remats when i also like stopped everything doing here at the ring it's another story topic that we haven't covered actually my focus switched from becoming the best, the biggest, saying yes to everything to like, okay, what about my mental health? What about my personal health? What am I going to do? And actually eventually finding someone, settling down and actually finding some, some of the local, very successful businessmen at the Nürburgring came to me uh, like a month ago or something. He said, it's good what you've done. I'm like, what do you mean? getting engaged and stuff because one day you might wake up and you might be the most successful YouTuber and you might be the most successful race car driver out there, but you will be like, for what? Who have I done this for? What for? And he's a very, uh, not only good businessman, but he's a very good family man because uh, I've been with his family and he's a very happy wife and daughter. So I'm like, you know what? That's actually cool. Like it's, it's, it's good that someone mentions that and uh, me without realizing it, uh, that I got some sort of this confirmation of that, that these are more important things in life. And unfortunately we have to go to the very big depths quite often to realize that they are the important things in life. It's not the subscribers, it's not the money, it's not everything. It's just actually who you are at the end of the day. And can you look yourself in the mirror? And, uh, yeah, of course there's going to be haters out there saying like you are whatever, whatnot. But if that's not true, and if, as long as you're true to yourself and others, that's what's the most important thing. So as we come to a close, I just want to kind of fire some quick fire questions at you <laughs> that I'm fascinated by. Sure. One of which is, I mentioned I'm lucky enough to have a Hurricane Purple Mante, mm -hmm. which was, I remember before I had the car, watching a lap record set at the Nürburgring of 6 minutes 52, mm -hmm. something along those lines. Was that lap real? That lap was real. That car was not a production car. So it was a race car. It was, yes, it was, uh, let's say it was something completely different. And um, so in, in your opinion, that, that was fraudulent. So when we come, yeah, when we speak about the Performante, when we speak about also other models, because up until four years ago, the Nürburgring lap records were not regulated. You could come turn up and do a lap time and say, this is what I've done. 
And quite often people also didn't even drive here at all. They would just say like, this is the lap time our car has done. And everyone would believe because everyone likes to believe in a good certainty. Why would someone lie about something? Why would someone lie about the big promises they make? You know, everybody's a bit naive, especially about these kinds of big things. So if you could only drive Porsches around the ring for the rest of time, yeah. Or you wouldn't be allowed to drive Porsches anymore, but you could drive any other brand. Uh -huh. What would you choose? Um, any other brand. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, Although I do believe that Porsche is the best car for the track here. I still would like to have a bit of vari variety in my life. If you could drive one car that you haven't driven around the ring, full chat, what would it be? Ooh, well, that's a very good question. So I would say Rimac Nevera, but I'd like to believe that this is about to happen in some point soon. Um, so I would have to go for something more like, the car that I always go to when I do sim racing is actually uh, uh, Pagani's on the R. So it would be something like that. Or maybe even something more classy and crazy, such as like Porsche 952 or a 962, uh, like these classic Group C race cars. That would be a completely different story, probably. Do you think the fastest lap in the next five years at the Nürburgring will be set by a human or by a robot? Uh, I think it's going to be AI. I think it's going to be an autonomous car. I'm not sure if it's going to be in the next five years, but... There, I believe personally myself, there are two factors that A, uh, I'm not sure that a person can withstand much more of the G-forces and the brain power that's required to compute at these certain speeds. But even if they are, and there are probably, I'm sure Max Verstappen can take his Formula One car out there. The problem that we're facing now is the everyone being so scared of legal consequences if something goes wrong. Because I know the four, uh, the 919 Porsche could have gone faster and Timo would have gone faster because his lap times were dropping every single time. But they said, okay, that's enough. We don't want to see the limit and potentially things going wrong. You have a nine, uh, no, sorry, a GT3 RS. Mm -hmm. And you're up against Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen in the same car on the ring. Who's quickest? Do you think you can beat them? I would say Max first, I'm second, Lewis third. I know Max is absolutely obsessed with the track knowledge and uh, with, with, the, with the track. He is racing it in sims, he is driving it, so he knows the track uh, like openly. He is the best driver out there. I would think my track knowledge opposed to Lewis, what I think to believe, you know, I think that's going to be a key factor here. But uh, otherwise, definitely P3 probably as well. So I don't know. Depends. Like, Do you think you will stay at the Nürburgring for the foreseeable future? Ooh. Um, well, <laughs> it's a difficult question. So uh, I'll tell it as is. I do not want to keep on doing this for the rest of my life. Uh, I w am now like looking at expanding in other ventures and not to be as dependent on this place, but I love it extremely. But at the same time, my fiance and to be wife, every time I go out there, she is scared and worried and I want to keep on doing that to her. So, uh, I will be probably at the ring. Yes. Will I be constantly driving cars and doing laps and doing stuff and making YouTube videos about that? Hopefully not. Will I stay here forever at the ring? Uh, probably also not. Uh, will it be in the next five years? Maybe, 10 years, maybe, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, at least uh, the next five years are probably definitely safe. I will keep on making videos and have fun here. Misha, I massively appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Thank you yeah. for your time. Thank you for coming on Road to Success. Thank you so much for the invite.